I would like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the 94th Psalm, Psalm 94, and we'll begin reading with just one verse in Psalm 94, the 11th verse. Psalm 94 and verse 11. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharpening a two-edged sword. We understand that. We know that the word of God is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We know the word of God liveth and abideth forever. Jewish historians say that this particular psalm was being read when the temple was destroyed by the Chaldeans, the first temple destruction. Centuries later, when the Romans destroyed the second temple, on the same month, the same day of the month that it was destroyed by the Babylonians or Chaldeans, the same psalm, Psalm 94, was being read. There's tremendous significance here concerning evil and what people imagine is going on and how it will all end. If you do not know the Lord, you have one way of thinking without God, apart from God. Another way entirely of thinking if you know the Lord and know what God's word teaches. We began with Psalm 94 and verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression, please. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man. Our thought life is a most powerful thing. When God made us, he made us spirit, soul, and body, in our spirit, we have a conscience. In our soul, we have intellect, emotion, and will. In our body, we have five gates or five senses. We process things a certain way in this, in this being that God has given to us, spirit, soul, and body. When we're born again, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, comes to live in us, lives in our spirit. It quickens us from the dead. And we process through these gates what we hear, what we say, what we taste, what we smell, what we feel. And we form opinions. When he made a spirit, soul, and body in our, our soul, we have intellect, emotion, and will. And so we process things, at least we should, intellectually, truthfully. What is right? What is the only fixed point of reference? What never changes? This we can count on. This is true. So that is fact. And then there is in this soul, this process of fact, or intellect, emotion, and then will. And when we're doing things the proper way, we know this is the truth. We respond to it emotionally, and we commit our will to it. But often we form wrong opinions. We live on an emotional basis or we gather information that is certainly not true. And we commit our emotions and our will to something that is not true. And one can build his or her life on something that is not true. And be totally convinced this is the way it should be done. This is what people should do. This is the way they should behave. When it's not that way at all. It's just not that way at all. I want to return to this psalm and we'll go through it verse by verse in a moment. But I want you to turn with me if you'll hold your place here. To the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're in a warfare, all of us. We're engaged in a warfare. It is a spiritual warfare. Paul declares in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present 
with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. And he continues on that thought of those who think that they're walking according to the flesh. In other words, you assume my behavior is like your behavior and your behavior is after the flesh. You think like a person without God who does not rely on the Lord, on the Lord's word, and you reach these basic conclusions from what you gather, but your thought life is after the flesh and not after the spirit, not after the Lord. He continues in verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. These are long-standing things, strongholds, set up long time by the world, the flesh, and the devil, ingrained things, strongholds. Let me read the verse again. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, the things that are long-standing, the things that are these things that people are ingrained to think, God is able to change that and to pull down those strongholds. Amen. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought. I want you to mark that, would you? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. When you and I are doing our thinking, and we do it all the time, don't we? We need to ask this question. Is every thought given to Christ? Or in the very words of Scripture, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Is this in accordance with the Lord? Is this thought in obedience to Christ? We live in a world that moves by its own will, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's our MO, our motive of operation, our own way. Anything to get our way. And we, we move through this circular reasoning and we rationalize things to bring it full circle back around to the way we want it to be. This is what we want. This is the way we want it to be. And so we make all points of interest to bring back around to that very thing to prove what we want to begin with. That's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Now, the great transformation that has to take place is that our thought life has to be brought into obedience to Christ. That's the greatest battle we face, you and I. That's the greatest battle we face. We say things, we respond to things, we can build an entire life on things that's not right. Only to realize too late in the journey that we wished to God a thousand times over. We hadn't planned it this way and lived it this way because it's not according to what God wanted. I want you to turn with me again as we think about this thought life to Philippians chapter 4 while we're in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul speaks to the, these Christians in Philippi concerning the thought life. He knows the power and potential of it. He says in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 4, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now notice he comes to verse 7 in this, this temporary conclusion. We're moving forward from it. But he says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep. That's garrison, guard like a military group brought in to make sure it stays a certain way. God says you can think a certain way 
think upon the Lord and know what is true about God and God's word. And the work of the Holy Spirit will enable you with the truth of God's word to have a peace of mind that passes all understanding. It will stand guard to your thought life. He even uses the expression, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, to accomplish that, the Lord says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You can't have this peace of heart and mind without thinking on these things. You ought to make that list your list and adopt it as a part of your life. Look at it again. True, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise. He begins with truth and concludes with praise. And the reason so many people are not living a life of praise to God is they have not begun that life with the truth. Now here's the change. If you turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible speaks of the word of God in verse 12 this way. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful Alive, the word quick means, it's alive and powerful, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now it might be interesting for you to know that nowhere in the Bible does God say that your soul and spirit can be separated. When you die, you leave your body behind. Your soul and spirit stays together to go be with God. But here the Bible says of itself, it is so powerful, so powerful that it is a discerner this way, so powerful that it can divide asunder of soul and spirit. In other words, what your spirit needs, what your soul needs. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharp as any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and Mara and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what we must deal with, our thought life. That's where the victory is won or lost, in our thought life. Now, in that context, I want us to look at this 94th Psalm. Remembering verse 11 says, if you have your eyes upon it there, Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man. And as we begin with Psalm 94 and verse 1, I want you to write this down, would you please? Let's consider the temporary triumph of wrong. The temporary triumph of wrong. There is an appearance of a temporary triumph of victory. The wicked are winning. Wrong is right. Think of that. And the Lord deals with that here as we open this 94th Psalm, this temporary triumph of wrong. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. There's such urgency and desperation. There is this heartfelt cry to God, Lord, we need to see you. We need to hear from you. You need to do what we cannot do and change what we cannot change. Show thyself. When I think of things to come, I think that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And when you want to define my convictions concerning what we call eschatology or things to come, 
I define myself as a pre-tribulation, pre-millennialist. I'm a little softer on people who aren't that way than some people are because I understand good men, godly men and women, good godly men and women hold to a different view of that than I do. And so I know there's still wonderful Christian people who do not hold to the same conviction I hold to that. I remember the first time I came to that conclusion, I was pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in the North City, Tennessee, and a medical doctor's widow was a member of our church, Mrs. Edith Taylor, and after the service, Mrs. Taylor came to me and she said, Pastor, Pastor, I must speak to you. I said, yes, Ms. Taylor. She said, did you know that you are a premillennialist? And a pre-tribulation premillennialist? I said, well, I, I've never defined myself that way. She said, well, you are. Furthermore, you and I are the only two like that in this church. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that. I know that Jesus Christ is coming again because we have his word on it. <clears throat> we have his word on it. And I believe the great tribulation will take place after the church has disappeared. But I want you to go to Syria and tell those people that. Or I'd like you to go in northern Iraq and tell all those Christian families who are marked for death that they won't go through tribulation. Somehow or another, we interpret the Bible to be an American Bible. But God is the father of all his children who've trusted him and been born into his family. We're all children of the devil by nature. And we must become children of God by faith and the new birth. Now they're not going through what the Bible calls the great tribulation, but they're going through terrible, terrible tribulation, wickedness and wrongdoing. As a matter of fact, one Christian spokesperson who's an historical authority said nothing like this has happened in our world since the days of Genghis Khan in the 1200s. And he spoke with some historical accuracy about things that that Mongol leader did. They're suffering. Here in this passage, someone is in such suffering they say, God, vengeance is in your hand. We're hurting. Show up. Wrong is being done to us. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things, and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see. Neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. That's the conclusion these people have reached who are causing this wickedness, who are doing this wrong. They're, they're moving from this perspective. We have thought it through and we're in authority and we believe this is what needs to be done and we're going to do it. I don't know how to get into the mind of people like a Hitler or like a Genghis Khan I mentioned earlier or like some leader among these warlords in the ISIS, this Islamic State group. I don't know how to get into their minds. But imagine the ferocity of these men, the force, when they really believe, they're convinced they're doing the right thing with hate and murder and death and savagery. 
I was watching a news broadcast the other day while I was in the New York City area conducting a pastor's college. And they brought a man on who's been an advisor to five ambassadors, five ambassadors in the Middle East. And he says, if this doesn't stop, if we don't stop it there, the next 9-11 is imminent. Imminent. It's at hand. Now, what do we do and how do we respond to this triumph, this temporary triumph of wrong? What would you tell those poor people whose family members are being killed, whose homes have marks put on them and they're destroyed, who say, become a Muslim or we'll kill you today in this moment, who watch family members and friends have their heads cut off. That's in our world, in this so-called civilized hour of the 21st century. There's this temporary triumph of wrong. Bring it down to a local level and you think our pitiful plight is nothing compared to what those people are going through. Nothing. Occasionally we get aggravated at somebody who's done me wrong and they may have done you wrong and it may have caused some hurt or some disappointment. It didn't work out the way we wanted it to work out. We got inconvenienced in something. And there is literally a temporary triumph for some wrongdoing. Does God have to give us perspective by bringing the most horrific thing on earth to our doorstep to help us understand the littleness we gripe about is nothing compared to what many brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are suffering. God help us. And by the way, I remind you and me, the Lord knows the thoughts of man. He knows our thoughts. There's a second thing I want you to see as we travel through this passage and that is just that. You come to this, the Lord knows the thoughts. Our thoughts, the thoughts of man, if you write it this way, the thoughts of man are known to God. Now they said he doesn't see and he doesn't care. I ask you a question. Does God see and does God care? We just need to answer that, don't we? If you need a verse, turn to the Proverbs just for a moment. In Proverbs chapter 15, the Bible says, in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So let's answer the first part of the question. Does God see? And that is an affirming what? Yes. God does see. He does see. Well, let me ask this. Does he care? They declare that God does not see. The covenant God of Israel does not see. Jehovah does not see. And he does not regard. Let's remove ourselves from this a moment and travel in our mind's eye to these terrible news reports we hear which ought to bring us to prayer for those people. Just as surely as we would want someone praying for us, we should be praying for them. Does God Almighty see what's going on there? Does he regard, does he see? The answer to both of those questions is yes. And he knows the thoughts. The thoughts of men are known to God. Let's pick up the psalm again. The Bible says, Ye, yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard. Understand, we come now to another, understand, ye brutish 
among the people, ye fools, when will ye be wise? God does know. He knows. Now this is an answer to the wrongdoers and to the wicked. Hold your place there, please, and turn with me to the last book of the Bible, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We come to the sixth chapter of the Revelation, and verse 9, God gives us a glimpse of people who've been martyred for their faith. Now, he's not speaking to those who have been martyred in Psalm 94 in the verses I just read to you, these brutish among the people. But those who have been suffering and put to death, they wonder what's going to happen and when's it going to happen. Does God see it? Is God going to do anything about it? And the Bible says in verses 9 and 10 of Revelation chapter 6, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The martyrs cry out, How long, how long? Before you judge, I said to you, the thoughts of men are known to God. God cares. He sees and he cares what's happening to his children. If you're going through something or you go through something in days to come and you wonder, why me? Why not you? Why am I going through this? I want you to get your mind off those things and understand this. God knows what you're going through. And God cares. He knows and he cares. Let's go on. In Psalm 94, the Bible says, He that planteth, verse 9, He that planteth the ear, shall he not hear? This logical word given by the psalmist as God gives him these words to pen. God made your ear. If he can make ears, don't you think he hears? He that planteth the ear, shall he not hear? He that formeth the eye, shall he not see? If he makes eyes, he made the eyes. He made the ears. Can he not hear and can he not see? He that chasteneth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? See, all truth proceeds from God. He's able. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. And so right in the middle of whatever we're dealing with, and I've been in some of those things and you've been in some of those things, and we wonder when we've tried to do the best we could do, why we misunderstood, why wrong seems to be triumphing for the moment. We need to turn from all of that to face the Lord in faith and know God does see this and God does care what I'm going through and I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. That leads us to the third thing. I want you to write it down, please. And it is the truth will prevail. The truth will prevail. So let's begin on that. We come now to verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord. Now that's that's a term for child rearing and giving us what we need, bring us in line. What's happening here? He's changing our thoughts. Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. You and I have to go through some correcting. That's not pleasant. For the moment, it's not pleasant. But it's necessary. It's like a child saying to a father who's disciplining him, you don't love me. And the child can understand 
No, son, it's because I love you that I'm exercising this discipline. Let's hold our place here and turn to the book of Hebrews again, would you please? And this will help us. In Hebrews, the Bible tells us in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, and this is God's word on this matter of chastening. The Bible says in verse 1 of 12, Hebrews, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. Well, what are we considering him? What are we going to consider about him? Well, Consider him, verse 3, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God is dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. In other words, if God doesn't deal with you as one of his children, then evidently you're not one of his children. You don't have a heavenly father. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days, and I'm sure my sons thought it was longer than a few days. They do it for a few days. They chased, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now here's the point I want to make. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which exercise thereby. Now, I want to stop right in my tracks and say, I'm not going to try to explain to you why evil is happening in the Middle East. I am not going to explain it. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try to talk to you about an argument between Abraham's behavior with Hagar. and I'm not going to get into that. I'm not. I understand those things and what people teach about those. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not trying to deal with that. I'm trying to deal with all these things that seem wrong and we know they're wrong from God's perspective. We understand as a Christian these are not right things to happen to others and happen to us. But yet, God is changing the way we're thinking, correcting us to think biblically, to bring our thought life into captivity to Christ, to bring us that we think on certain things and we don't, Excuse my expression, please. We don't, excuse me for saying this, run our mouths about everything imaginable that's meaningless in this world. While some people are dying, evidently for nothing they've done. And we think we're having a pinprick of some kind in our situation. God knows the thoughts of man and he's going to work on our thought life. Back to Psalm 94 and you may add quickly. The Bible says in verse 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teacheth him out of thy law. He's correcting us. That thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. 
I'd like to have that rest in the adversity. You see, we won't rest from adversity. May I read it again? That thou must give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. There is adversity. Do you know that in the middle of something we're going through, we can have peace and rest by trusting God? It's like this. You say, I'd like to go down there with Moses to Egypt and get those people out. We would have said, if you just go down there first and kill Pharaoh. Lord, if you'll kill all our obstacles, we'll be happy to do anything you want us to do. But God doesn't work that way. He proves that he's greater than anything we face by going with us to face those obstacles. He changes the way we think. I need that change. Do you need that change? The Bible goes on to say, in verse 14, for the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. But we don't have to dwell in silence because God is our help. When I said my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. How did that happen? How did that happen? Many times our thought life upsets our soul. How did this happen? God deals with us. He chastens his children. He brings us in line. He gives us a greater understanding as we faith him and trust him. And now, in the multitude of my thoughts, my thoughts, my thoughts, they're within me, within me. I didn't have to go somewhere else and get it. They're within me. Thy comforts, Lord. What I'm thinking about now brings thy comforts. Delight my soul. Isn't that the way God intended for it to be? Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Truth will prevail. And we just need to pray, God, help me to have these true things to think on, to live by. Transform my thought life and help me to keep my eyes upon you. And Lord, you know the thoughts that are in me and the ones that are wrong, change them and transform them so that in the multitude of my thoughts that are within me, as I think upon you, I'll find the comfort that I need for my soul in the midst of all of this. There's an old story about Dr. John R. Rice being robbed. Someone broke into his house. They had a gun. They threatened to kill him. They're going to rob him and steal everything he's got, which wasn't much. And he said to the robbers, don't think for one minute you can threaten me with heaven. I know where I'm going when I leave here. And they had the opportunity to witness to them, speak to them about the Lord. I just thought of that old story and I heard him tell it. 
years ago. Because you and I need in us what will see us through when it seems like there's a temporary triumph to wrongdoing. God's going to come through people. He's coming through. The king is coming again. Heaven's our home. We can't lose. Jesus is our savior. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and I give them eternal life. He said, they hear my voice and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Listen, truth will prevail. Take hope, take heart, press on, keep your eyes on the Lord. Let's bow in prayer, may we? Say, Pastor, you've caught me. You've caught me in a moment. You've caught me in a moment of weakness and complaining and trouble. Yes. And you'd catch me in many of those too. But when I think I know better, I know God is with us. You know that too, don't you? God, work on my thought life. May I think on the things that I ought to think on to get that thought life right and to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. How many of you know God himself by his spirit is working on your heart right now with that need? Would you lift your hand, hold it high? Come on, be an honest person. Amen. You see, I know, I know about this day, a little bit about this day, how people get troubled, how they think about all the question marks and ifs and how can and all of that. The answer is not in answering the questions. The answer is we're in God's hands. We're in God's hands. Truth will prevail.